Life has a way of crowding itself with needless complications. Layer upon layer of intricacies accumulating until it's difficult to tell what's truly important from what has become habit and overworked patterns. Only by removing ourselves from what is superfluous and excessive can we find quieter ground and recalibrate our senses. In this project I wanted to strip away all the redundancies and focus on the delicate interplay between sound and light. It would also serve as a brief respite after months of working on projects with exhausting levels of intricate detail. In the process of simplifying things, I also hope to simplify myself by doing things as quickly as possible before moving on to the next aspect of the process. I wanted to spend a maximum of two days on each step to keep the creative process as fluid as possible. The project was completed over a period of ten days, and this is the documentation of that period. The first couple of days were spent on the visual design and electronics. I made fairly quick work of it by limiting myself to using only the Daisy seed with no additional audio electronics. The Daisy unfortunately doesn't go along very well with other timing sensitive libraries such as Fast LED, so I had to add an Arduino Nano to handle the light, with the two microcontrollers communicating rudimentarily through analog to digital conversion. The choice of amplification was a PAM8403, powered by a 5 volt regulator shared with an LED matrix, and the speaker being the now almost inevitable Dayton Audio ND65. As for the visual design, I already had a vague idea of a lamp-like structure, so it was only a matter of fleshing it out in the computer. Essentially a box hiding a speaker and an LED matrix. Due to the intrinsic simplicity of both the idea and technical content, the visual design was done in just a few hours. Reveling in the light over this speedy process, I constantly had to keep myself from adding more and more layers of complexity to the structure. While I value what comes after a long period of iterative design, I also value the resulting motivation that can only come from completing what is started. Spending exorbitant amounts of time on a single aspect of a process can make one forget that there's an entire canvas to be filled, and I wanted to approach this project as a unified whole rather than as a collection of details. As this was a self-imposed challenge of speediness, I had pondered a while on the best strategies for reducing the amount of time spent in front of the CNC. This meant getting as much out of each sheet as possible to avoid manual intervention, both in terms of work holding and tool changes. The sculpture called for four black and five white pieces of acrylic to be processed. The black 8mm thick pieces would form the outer shell of the speaker enclosure, while the white pieces would serve as light diffusers for the LED matrix. Sockets and potentiometers are typically designed for more modest panel thicknesses of up to 3mm, with threads much shorter than the 8mm acrylic used here. To accommodate for this, an area for the user interface was carved down to 2mm using an adaptive clearing, giving the nuts ample thread to grip on their respective components. As I had done in another project half a year earlier, I wanted to create a seamless, uniform surface appearance by joining beveled sheets. This was done by first cutting the contour and then making a series of very shallow passes to form a 45 degree chamfer along the edge. Having learned from my previous mistake of being overly reliant on acrylic glass to form the speaker enclosure, I decided to 3D print a sort of internal enclosure within the enclosure, invisible to the naked eye. Not only would this provide a better seal and prevent sound waves from escaping through the gaps between the acrylic sheets, but it would also reinforce the overall structure, hopefully resulting in a decrease in vibration radiating to other parts of the assembly. The 3D print also worked as a prototype, providing a useful preview of the expected acoustics while working on the sound design. There is usually some uncertainty about how the final sound will turn out, acoustically speaking, 
which is typically only resolved once a sculpture is finished. But this new technique helped reduce that ambiguity earlier on in the process. I had some minor issues with the new low-profile inserts I had been experimenting with. As I pushed them in with a soldering iron, the threads got filled with molten plastic and had to be tapped manually afterwards to clean them out. As a bonus round in experimentation, I added some vibration dampening tape to the inner walls of the enclosure. It's actually designed to increase acoustic insulation and decrease vibration in plasterboard construction, so I thought it was worth a try in this application as well. The difference was likely negligible, but in theory it should help reduce sharp resonances. The algorithmic composition employed in this sculpture was more or less written in parallel with the other aspects of the overarching build process, so no specific day was allocated to that particular step. But again, the goal was to be as minimal as possible, and I had to be ruthless and decisive to not get carried away. Two arpeggiating oscillators at different rhythmical subdivisions, utilizing voice leading to slowly evolve over time. At each power cycle, both oscillators are assigned to a triad and a direction in which to arpeggiate. Through an aleatoric process, random notes within the chord are nudged up or down by a set interval after a specific amount of repetition. Since the oscillators are pre-tuned to a fixed musical scale, this behavior is very similar to creating random chord progressions on a piano using, for instance, only the white keys. As a last element of surprise, a rhythmical sequencer is activated some time into the proceedings, overseeing a gradual deconstruction of the arpeggiating foundation by removing one note at a time. These two parallel processes, the first in the pitch domain and the other in the temporal, causes each song to progress into something wildly different than what it promised at the outset. For all its positive traits, the drawback of a speedrun like this is the lack of time to properly assess the physical feasibility of every operation. Two accent pieces needed to be manually drilled and tapped before being mounted to the LED diffuser, but the size of the chuck and length of the drill bit had not been accounted for. This was solved by 3D printing an extension to the drill bit at the cost of reduced concentricity. It's one of those things that should be on your mental checklist during the design process, running through all the operations in your head to make sure everything is physically accessible, both during assembly and disassembly. But again, the point of this project was not to be perfect, but to let go of details and allow the process itself to take the driver's seat, almost as if the decision-making is left to chance. And by leaving those decisions to chance, they begin to transcend your own style and preferences, and there is a strange kind of freedom in that. By allowing the work to unfold and responding to it as instinctively as possible, you're no longer polishing an idea to match your own internal ideals. Instead, the result exists outside your usual habits, almost as if it's not your own. This piece was never about the result, but rather about the process itself. Although only vaguely related to John Cage's concept of indeterminacy, one of its core principles is the idea of letting things be themselves, free from the ego of the creator. In the case of Cage, the process is open and the outcome is variable, but in our case it's almost the inverse. The outcome is fixed and the process remains open. Like a piece of generative art where the accumulated memories and experiences of the creator take the place of aleatoric and probabilistic components, or a jazz improvisation where the outcome inevitably is permeated by the performer's subconsciously pre-rehearsed choice of notes and scales. I like to think of it as an archaeological filtering through each individual's creative habitus, where design or musical challenges are resolved through intuition formed by personal patterns and disposition. No choice is truly random, but rather an expression of an embodied history. So what started as an attempt to streamline my own process, 
to avoid overcalculating and getting needlessly stuck on fine details, ended up becoming an introspective reflection on instinctual creative inclinations formed by subconscious habits in the vein of Pierre Bourdieu's Habitus and Doxel. It's not my swankiest work by any means, but any chance to step back and reflect on your own reasons for action is worth taking. If you liked or disliked the video, uh, let me know in the comments. I'll do my best to answer any questions, and if you're feeling particularly frisky, you can join me on Patreon, where I upload schematics and code for every project, as well as the occasional tutorial and progress video.